candidate at UNT and has had an amazing spring and summer in terms of her presentation opportunities and success with all various groups that she's presented to you on this topic today, Native Technology. I saw her at the uh, NIPSOT meeting in May, I believe it was, and I know she's already uh, presented to, I think, the North Texas chapter and the Cross Timbers chapter, but she's saving the best for her hometown. Yes. <laughs> the Elmport chapter, Denton County. Uh, a little background on Jessica. Uh, she's been working on her PhD program for five years and will be called Dr. Beckham next year, or maybe by the end of this year. Maybe by the end. But they came in between. <laughs> so I do a role as mom and doctor, which is a, a tough, a tough deal. Uh, research involves an interdisciplinary approach to studying bumblebees, and uh, specifically Texas bumblebees. Broadly interested in conserving native pollinators and finding ways that we and bumblebees can coexist. Better than copperhead snakes. <laughs> uh, current projects are evaluating presence and persistence of bumblebees across northeast Texas and studying the use of urban green spaces by bumblebees and native plants. Everybody, please welcome Jessica Becker. <laughs> Thank you. Let me get all turned on here. All right, so yeah, thank y'all so much for having me today. I'm looking forward to talking to my hometown, or my second home, I guess it is. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about bumblebees specifically, and their sort of background on bumblebees, and then how to identify bumblebees here in Texas, then give you some ideas of the research I'm doing, and then finally tell you a little bit about what you can do to help conserve our, our little fuzzy friends. So before I, I tell you too much about bumblebees, I just want to make sure that you know what a bumblebee is, because there are 20,000 species of bees on this planet. Most of us, okay, is it on? Uh, most of us, when we think about a bee, we think about the honeybee, the European honeybee. Think about honey, um, you think about managed hives. Um, the, the European honeybee is not native to the United States. It is sort of a naturalized citizen. It came here in the 1600s with European settlers, and it's pretty much become ubiquitous. Um, but again, it's not a native species. It's a little bit smaller than a bumblebee, and the coloration on it is, they're black and yellow bands, but they're more amber-colored yellow. Bumblebees are much larger and much hairier than the honeybee. Um, they're pretty much covered from head to abdomen with hair. And in Texas, they're primarily black and yellow, and the yellow coloration is much brighter than a honeybee. Um, so this is an American bumblebee. It's our most common bumblebee that you'll see here in our area. The other large-bodied bee that you'll see that you might confuse with the bumblebee is the eastern carpenter bee, and that's this one over here. The big tell that this big bee is not a bumblebee is a bright, shiny abdomen. The abdomen on a, a, an eastern carpenter bee is pretty much hairless. So it zooms around and you see that shiny abdomen, you know it's a, a carpenter bee, not a bumblebee. All right, so that's just a basic introduction. Bumblebees particularly are very important pollinators. Um, pollinators in general are considered keystone species in our terrestrial ecosystems. They, they move pollen and um, basically the, the ecosystem requires these flowering plants to persist for everyone to eat. So insects particularly pollinate 80% of our wild flowering plants and 75% of our cultivated flowering plants, so things that we eat. Um, you might have heard the statistic that every third bite of food is dependent on a pollinator species. So bumblebees and bees in general are really great pollinators because they deliberately pick up pollen. This is in, in um, contrast to things like butterflies and beetles, which just sort of roll around in it and really just nectar on the, the plants. Bees have to collect that pollen and take it back to their larvae, which are their brood or their young, um, for them to eat. So you can see this bumblebee here has collected pollen and bumblebees pack it into curbicula or pollen baskets on their back legs. 
So because they're deliberately collecting that pollen, they're getting really messy and they're moving lots of pollen around those plants and so are really efficient pollinators. Um, let's see, bumblebees are, so they require nectar for their carbohydrates and they require pollen for their proteins and lipids. They're also generalists, so that makes them another, or that's another reason why they're good pollinators. So they pollinate lots of different types of plants. They don't just specialize on one species or one family of plants. Um, their large, hairy bodies also make them really messy eaters. And then finally, sort of a plug for bumblebees over honeybees is that they're able to buzz pollinate. So y'all might know that some plants have anthers, which are the pollen-producing structures, which must be shaken in order for the pollen to be released. They're almost like salt shakers. Honeybees do not grab onto those types of anthers and shake them. So it basically is one type of plant that, or one group of plants that honeybees can't pollinate. Bumblebees, on the other hand, grab a hold of those anthers, buzz their wing muscles, supposedly at a middle C, and that effectively releases the pollen. Some examples of plants that require buzz pollination are tomatoes, potatoes, and chili peppers. So those are important plants for us. Um, so anyways, they're, they're just really great pollinators. So here's um, an example of the bumblebee life cycle. In contrast to honeybees, bumblebee life cycle, or bumblebee hives last for about one year only. Honeybees can persist for multiple years. Um, so a bumblebee hive life cycle begins in, technically, in the, in the um, fall when a queen digs down and overwinters, but we'll get there. So in the springtime in about March or April here in, in our area, new queens will emerge from their overwintering sites and basically look for a nest site. So if you see a bumblebee early in the spring, it's most likely a new queen. They're really big, too. I've heard them described almost like flying hamsters. They're not that big, but they, they are large. Um, so these queens will, will forage, they look for a nest site, and they'll find their nest site and actually build their, their nest. So queens are really busy in the springtime. Um, they, they'll start their first brood too, so they'll lay maybe eight or ten eggs in that first brood. And for five to six weeks, that queen does everything for the nest. So she's foraging, she's trying to keep that nest warm because it can still be cold, and basically takes care of it. But as those broods start to emerge as adults, again, that's about five or six weeks later, those workers will take over the duties of the nest and the hive. These workers that, or these, these um, brood that she's rearing at this part of her cycle are all sterile workers. So they're all females and they all are sterile. So that brood, or that nest will grow and grow till middle of the summer to late summer to maybe 500 individuals if it's a really, really healthy hive. So around this time of year, you typically start to see lots and lots of bumblebees because those nests have gotten really large. Now, I will say this year, it doesn't seem like bumblebees are doing very well in our area, and I'm thinking it's because of the flooding. I didn't mention this, but bumblebees nest typically in the ground or at the ground surface, so all of this flooding that we've had, I think, just drowned our bumblebees out. I've only seen a very few numbers here in our area, um, and last weekend, I went out to Fanning County, 500-acre ranch, and... They've had many, many bumblebees in the past. We saw two all day, um, which was really sad. So anyhow, um, usually you've got lots of bees this time of year. And about early fall, maybe late August, early September, that queen is going to switch from making workers to making new reproductives. So she'll make new queens and males at that time. Those will go off, mate, the males will die, and those mated queens will dig under and overwinter as mated queens. Meanwhile, the old queen, she does not switch back to, to making workers, so the hive basically just falls into disrepair. Um, they die off, and it's the end of that, that hive's life. So all that being said, things to think about as, I'm talking, as I go through this talk is that bumblebees require three types of habitat. They require the nest site, which again is underground or in thatchy grass. They really like prairies. Um, they need foraging sites, which are flowers, and they need that all the way from about March through October 
here in our area. And then finally, they need overwintering sites for the queen. Here in Texas, historically, we've had nine species um, recorded. This is a really nice little quick guide to identifying the workers here in Texas. The males look a bit different. Um, and this, was, this figure was done by Michael Warner from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And you can find this on his website, which I believe is texasbumblebees.com. So if you're interested, I'll, I'll have that at the end too, that you can write it down. But anyways, here in our area, the species which are circled have been recorded. So we've got about six species that historically have been here. But currently, our two most common species are Bombus pennsylvanicus, also known as the American bumblebee, and Bombus fraternus, which is the Southern Plains bumblebee. Um, the, the big difference that you'll note is, are these banding patterns on the thorax. So the American bumblebee has a yellow band followed by a patch of black on the thorax, which is the middle part of an insect. On the Southern Plains bumblebee, it's a very stark yellow, black, yellow, and you can kind of see that there. I think it sort of is a cat eye shape on, on that Southern Plains bumblebee. Also, if you look a little bit more closely, you'll see that the Southern Plains bumblebee's um, hairs are much shorter. So it's like it has a buzz cut, literally. <laughs> um, versus, I know, that's so funny. Um, but the American bumblebee is a little bit hairier, a little messier. So those are the two most common species you'll see around here. Doesn't mean those are the only ones, but if you, those, are the, those are the first ones to try and identify here. Unfortunately, bumblebees are declining worldwide. Every continent where bumblebees are found, you've got species which are nearing extinction, and that includes in North America. Six of those nine species that have been found in Texas have been documented as declining in other parts of the United States. Texas species, or, or the, the populations here in Texas have historically been understudied, so it's really hard to say if they're declining here or not. But again, in other parts of the United States, all of these species in red are having problems. And you can see that is to include that Southern Plains bumblebee and the American bumblebee. And I just put sonoris here in um, parentheses because there's been some evidence to say that these really should be put together as a species. I guess if you're a lumper, you'd put those together. Um, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has made Bombus pennsylvanicus as well as Bombus variabilis species of greatest conservation need. So they've got a conservation action plan um, and they've made those priorities for, con for conservation. Some of the threats that bumblebees are facing are disease, um, in particular pathogen spillover from managed populations. And not only will managed bumblebee diseases spread to our wild bumblebees, but there's been recent evidence to show that diseases um, found in honeybees will spread to bumblebees as well. Um, so there's some, some viruses and fungi that will affect them. Also, pesticides are really bad for bees. Pesticides are made to kill insects. So if they're killing your pests, they're also killing your bees. And I've got a slide on that in just a few minutes where you can see all of the negative effects. The expansion of monoculture in, agri in agriculture is also really bad for bumblebees in particular because remember, bumblebees require flowers blooming from March all the way through October here. When you have a monoculture, you've got vast, ac vast acreage full of a plant that blooms for just a few weeks of the year. So in effect, you are kind of starving your bees the rest of the year. Um, one of the ways to mitigate that is to plant hedgerows around the fields that are full of flowering plants that persist through the rest of the year. But the worst thing for bumblebees is habitat loss due to human activity. And in particular, the expansion of concrete destroys their habitat because they need to nest underground, they can't dig into concrete, and they need flowers. So concrete does not give way for flowers. So that, that's really the worst thing for bees. And that's been kind of the impetus for my studies that I've been doing at UNT. So I'll start here with one of the studies I've been doing, which has been on the persistence of bumblebees in Northeast Texas. So we re like I said, we really don't know the status of bumblebees here. And so this study was 
a um, partnership with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department to kind of look at bumblebees here in Northeast Texas. So these are the historic records of bumblebees. And that's where we got the, the fact that there's nine species that have been recorded here. And you can see that Bombus pennsylvanicus was our most common species historically, and Bombus fraternus was our second most common species. But again, we don't know how they, or we haven't known how they're doing up here until very recently. So for the last um, few years, I have been going out and doing roadside surveys in the counties in our region. I, in particular, did 16 counties over the last two years. And then Michael Warner, again, from Texas Parks and Wildlife, did a couple more counties. So we've got this 24 region or 24 county region where we have looked at bumblebees. And roadside surveys consist of me basically driving down the road and looking for patches of flowers, stopping, doing 15-minute timed walks through those flowers. And I would catch one voucher specimen of each species. And so we, again, just like the historic records, found that Pennsylvanicus was our most common species, and every dot rec represents um, a spot where we saw Bombus pennsylvanicus. Fraternus was our second most common, and then the brown-belted bumblebee, which I haven't mentioned yet, was the third most common. You can't really see on this map, but these were spots where we found more than one species. So there were sites where there were two or three species present. Um, so anyhow, the, that's what we found recently. Good news is we found lots and lots of bees on roadsides, so it seems like those bees were doing pretty well here. Um, in 2014, I also thought to maybe not only um, look at the presence of bumblebees, but also try to get a relative abundance count to see who was the most common. And so on, during that year, I'd really just found Pennsylvanicus and Fraternus. It was about an 80-20 breakdown. So the yellow parts of the pie chart represents the numbers of Pennsylvanicus at each site, and then the greens, the, the number, numbers of Fraternus. The good news was that when I did my statistical analysis, those levels were almost exactly the same as historic levels. So sort of, even though in other parts of the United States these species are declining, we're thinking that they're doing all right here. On the other hand, maybe we just can't detect the declines because the historic data are so, um, we, we just don't have very much historic data. But that's good news for bumblebees up here. So all of that put together made me think, hey, maybe roadsides are sort of a ground zero for bumblebee conservation. You can see here, this is an example of one of the roadsides. You see lots and lots of sunflowers. This is a different type of roadside with pretty much nothing because it's been mowed. I'm not the first person to think that roadsides would be a good place to start for conservation of pollinators. Um, in a study done in Kansas, I'm sorry, in a study done in Kansas, they found that native roadsides, so roadsides that had been restored to prairie flowers, had similar diver bee diversity to um, basically prairies or natural areas. And in May of this year, President Obama put out a national strategy to promote the health of honeybees and other pollinators. In that strategy, he suggested, or the committee suggested, that I-35 should be made into a pollinator corridor. So that highway runs all the way from Minnesota to Laredo. The idea is not to necessarily plant flowers right alongside the busiest stretches of I-35, right? But to kind of have a buffer zone around I-35 where flowers are planted and um, just basically use these spaces which are otherwise not used. So, so the ways to do that are to increase the native flowering plants in those areas, but also one of the biggest problems that I found when I was trying to do these roadside surveys was mowing practices. Lots of times I would drive down a road and it was just mowed, 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 mowed. And so if we could maybe alter some of those mowing practices to even just mow a little bit later after the plants have bloomed out, it would be really helpful for our pollinators and our bumblebees specifically. So the other study that I've been working on is, is the urban green space study. So you might recall a few slides earlier, I said that habitat loss due to human activity is the biggest driver of bumblebee declines. But 
That being said, we've got lots of green spaces in our cities. And green spaces are defined as open land in urban areas which are primarily covered with vegetation. They've been shown to give health and psychosocial benefits to people and increase property value, help control pollution. There's also been a few studies to show that they can help to conserve native ecosystems by connecting habitat fragments. So ultimately, they have the potential to serve as habitat islands for bumblebees. So I went out to a number of different urban green spaces to check and see if that's really true here in Denton County. This is just one of our little green spaces, the Bowling Green Community Garden. So the, that study entailed me looking at the current presence of bumblebees in the county at basically eight different sites. And those included the Cardo's Farm Project back when it was out in Ponder. And that's an organic farm. They don't use any pesticides out there, grow food crops. That was a couple acres out there. Then the Bowling Green Community Garden and Shiloh Field, which are here in the city of Denton, both of those are places where people, citizens, can grow their own food within individual plots. They also have a lot of flowers around, which is great. And Clear Creek Natural Heritage Center is what I considered sort of an urban wild space, and we're all probably all familiar with that as well, run by the city of Denton. And then finally, I looked at four different sites out at Leela, the Lake Louisville Environmental Learning Area, which is about a 2,000 acre preserve, which is being returned to Native Prairie. And in that study, it, I also included their pollinator garden as one of my sites. So I basically went out there in, this was in summer of 2013, and we, we went out there during July and August every two weeks and did direct <laughs> counts of our individuals and in a catch and release style, and then we're going to do some DNA analysis to look at the number of hives that I was sampling. So everyone is always interested in, well, how to do catch and release these. So basically, we do these timed walks and catch them in nets, sometimes more than one individual in a net, like here. This guy, Paul, in particular, loved bringing back about 15 bees to me. I'm like, what do I do with 15 bees? Because I tried to put, or I did put them each in individual collecting jars. When you're sticking your hand into a net of 15 bees, that's a little scary sometimes. But I never got stung, not once. Um, but anyhow, so I, I would take them, put them in individual collecting jars, and into a cooler which cooled them down and anesthetized them. So it basically put them to sleep, but didn't kill them. And then when they were asleep, I amputated a toe from their left middle leg. Um, and it's not really a toe, it's the terminal tarsal segment of their leg. And you can see here's a razor blade and that little bitty black speck, that's the size of the the piece that I was taking from each of the bees. And so that, in effect, gave me a DNA sample, and it also marked the bees, so I wasn't counting them more than once. Um, and then we just warmed them up in the sun, and they flew away. So that, that practice was not something that I came up with on my own. That's been done before. All the research shows that it doesn't affect their lifespans or their foraging capabilities. And I can attest to that because Many times when we'd return to a site, some of the first bees that I'd be catching had toes removed. So they were still going back to the exact same places, the sites of the incidents, and they were fine. Um, so so that, that information, I'm still working on those, that DNA stuff. It should be done by December, though. Um, but I'm working on it, and it's going to ultimately tell me the number of hives that I had sampled because it's important to know the number of bees, but also, you know, if I, I collected 100 bees all from one hive, that's not as, um, as, as good as if I had collected 100 bees from 50 different hives. So that I'll get that information from the DNA samples. Um, in addition, we're doing some land use analyses to figure out what habitat factors might influence the numbers of bees that we saw at each site. So what were, these are our preliminary results here. We collected samples from 450 individual bees um, in the two species, the Bombus fraternus and Bombus pennsylvanicus. Interestingly, um, I thought that I would find more diversity out at Leela because it's such a great place and it has way more flowers and way more nesting sites, 
But my, I found both species actually at Bowling Green, that tiny little community garden, and then at Clear Creek. Didn't find them out at Leela, despite the fact that we, we collected hundreds of bees out there. Um, so we're still trying to figure out why that was. Not sure, maybe Dr. Steigman can tell me why. <laughs> yeah, put you in the hot seat. Um, anyhow, but, but it was, the good news is that there's lots of bumblebees in our urban spaces here in Denton County. So we need to continue to conserve those places and maybe even expand them in our county as we move forward. Um, like I said, I'm continuing to do that DNA analysis. I have finished all the extractions. I've done nine, um, nine reactions on every single one of those. So an extraction plus nine reactions. So 10 things for 450. So you can think 4,500. 4, and so I've been pipetting for two years, it feels like. But I'm done with the lab work. Now it's just to put it in the computer and tell me my answers. Um, and, and then I'm also in the process of doing those land use analyses. So we'll have the rest of those answers soon. So all that being said, you've learned about bumblebees. You've learned about their plight. You've also learned that we've got lots of bumblebees here in Denton County. So what can you do to help conserve them? Well, a few things to keep in mind in your gardens or if you have property is that you want to have blooms present March through October. And you want to have, if possible, three to five different species of flowers blooming during that time period or during each time period. Varied colors and shapes will be more nutritious to your bumblebees. That will also help you to attract other pollinators as well. And then finally, try and avoid the use of pesticides. And when I think of an ideal garden for bumblebees, I think of a prairie. This is a picture of the prairie out at Leela, I think in late May, early June. So you can see lots of different types of flowers blooming. And there's also space for them to nest if they wanted to. Um, if you're in an urban area, this is my neighbor's garden. She's, she has converted her entire front yard into flowering plants. And you can see there's kind of like a mix of, of natives and non-natives in there. But what I love about her garden is that she, she has things blooming pretty much all but about two months of the year. And I've seen bumblebees in there. I've seen probably 25 different species of bees in her garden. Lots, she has monarchs all the time. So, that's sort of the gold standard. I'm still trying to convince my husband that that's what we need to do, you know? So it's a, it's a little bit of a hard sell. But if you maintain it, it looks really nice, I think. Um, so why avoid pesticides? I just want to hit on this because people, well, it's been in the news a ton lately, um, the, the negative effects of pesticides. Um, and people always wonder, is it okay if I use pesticides in my garden? Well, the short answer is no, it's not okay. But I know it's unavoidable at some times. Um, but why shouldn't you use pesticides? Because it's bad for bees. Bees encounter pesticides through direct contact with sprays. So you could directly spray them. But um, more and more, they're uptaking those chemicals in contaminated nectar and pollen. So there's this class of pesticides that are systemic that are applied to the seeds. This includes neonicotinoids and some of your pyrethroids and those stay in the seeds and then as the plants grow up it continues and persists in all of the tissues of the plants including the nectar and the pollen. So as bees or other insects go out and collect those um, food sources for them they're eating toxic chemicals as well. And I don't know the exact decay rate of those, but if you have plants that only persist for a year, they're gonna have those pesticides in them throughout their lives. Um, so it's really bad. Just recently, a couple months ago, a paper came out where they had a really nice study that offered sugar water that had been laced with neonicotinoids versus just plain sugar water to honeybees and bumblebees, and they found that the bees preferred the ones that had the neonicotinoids in them. So yeah, that's even worse. It, they're, you know, neonicotinoids are nicotinoids, so maybe they're literally getting a little bit of a buzz, just like cigarettes. Um, but anyways, they prefer it, so they're uptaking those specifically, or directly. Um, so what happens to bumblebees? There's reduced food consumption by the workers and the queen. There's increased brood or um, larvae and egg mortality. 
There's decreased worker survival rates and lower rates of foraging activities by the workers. So all that put together means that there's frequent hive failure. So those hives are dying out before they're producing new queens and males, and so it's a genetic dead end for, for those bees. Um, not only are bumblebees and honeybees at risk, recent evidence has shown that things like your mason bees that you may know and love, um, and other wild bees are also at risk. So these things are, they're broadcast pesticides. They affect all your insects. And not only are bees affected, they've also found that these pesticides are persisting up the food chain in places. So in Netherlands, the bird declines were also linked to pesticide use. So sadly, we might be entering a silent spring. Um, but let's end on a high note. Here are, some, here are some things. So don't use pesticides if you can help it. And let's plant some flowers in your yards if you can. I have, I've got some examples of plants that I really recommend for bees and bumblebees specifically. And I've tried to put them sort of in order of blooming. So starting in the spring and then we'll, we'll go through the fall. So the red bud is a great plant. This is also really good for your blue orchard bees or, or mason bees. You'll see those, these, these bloom maybe in March or April. Those blue orchard bees will also come out. They're only active for about a month. They're beautiful little bees that love the red buds. Salvias are great. Um, here's a, a native salvia, the mealy blue sage. There's also a lot of um, non-native salvias, which do really well here. This is, I think the variety is like hot lips or fire lips, something like that. But this is in my yard. It lives through anything, it seems like. And it's huge at this point. And this is a bumblebee that was in my little urban garden. Uh, the Cenizo, also known as the Texas Sage, is great. It sort of blooms all through the summer when it rains. And lots of different pollinators will go to that. Here's sort of an early wildflower that you'll see. Uh, that'll bloom in May or June and attract lots of pollinators. Your firewheel, Gallardia pulchella. The Texas Thistle is wonderful. That's sort of a, I don't know, some people think of that more as a weedy plant, but I think it's great. It's got lots of good nectar for your pollinators. And similarly, your basket flower will, will give lots of nectar for the pollinators. This, I think, was out at Leela as well. Just a beautiful field of basket flowers. These are great too, cone flowers um, attract tons of things. They're blooming about now. Maybe they're blooming out about now. Um, they're good. Milkweeds as well. I guess the, there was a new um, guidebook that came out, I guess, last week or the week before last, where I didn't realize there were so many species of milkweeds here in Texas, 20 or 21, something like that. Um, so milkweeds are great. The bumblebees actually prefer these two, I think because they're bigger blooms than some of the other milkweeds. So these are the antelope's horn and the, the viridus, the green milkweed. And this was one of the most, or one of my most commonly collected from plants when I was out in the field the last few years. Um, and of course, milkweed is not only going to be good for your bumblebees, but also for your monarchs. The monarchs, as are their host specific for these, they lay their eggs on the milkweeds, and or they have to lay their eggs on the milkweed. Then the button bush, this is something that gets a bit shrubby. It can get really big, actually. But that's a queen butterfly on it. Bees love it, too. And now we're getting towards kind of the end of the summer um, in terms of blooming. So the ironweed is great. Here's another queen butterfly and an American bumblebee on ironweed. And the mist flower, this is something that I, this is a plant that I just learned last summer. I'm not, a, I'm not a plant biologist, but this is planted all over my neighborhood, and I kept on seeing monarchs and queen butterflies all over it. So finally, I was lurking in someone's yard, and they're like, do you want some of that? And I said, well, what is it? Um, so anyways, it's, mist flower is a great thing. This is a monarch here on the mist flower. Sunflowers, goodness, on, on the roadside, sunflowers are so common because they love the disturbed soil. I guess milkweeds do too. 
But sunflowers were another one that I was really commonly collected from. Here's the Southern Plains bumblebee and also a blister beetle that's enjoying the sunflower, a monarch on a Maximilian sunflower. <clears throat> and you can plant na natives, of course, are best, but they'll go to non-native sunflowers as well. And our Leatris, this is the, the gay feather specifically. Again, a later blooming flower. And the Oringo, this is a great plant for your bees. So, so those are just a few examples of plants that I recommend. I've got some plant lists that I can recommend in a second as well. But before I, I end, I want to kind of give a plug for the next project that I'm working on which I'm going to start on probably in January. Um, but I'm going to be modeling statewide distributions of bumblebee species. And we got a grant from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department to do that as well. Um, so in order to model those distributions, though, I need presence data. I've got my data. I've got some citizen science data. But it's really important to fill in gaps around the state to have lots of people helping with that. So you can help by taking photos of bumblebees that you see, recording the date and location, and then uploading them to a variety of sources. And when I say recording the location, I mean, it can be as simple as just your address. But I've actually downloaded a free app on my phone, which is a GPS um, app. So you can do that as well. That's the, the gold standard for location. Give me the Latin long. I can very easily input that. But anyhow, you can, if you, I, you might be using any of these. Um, iNaturalist, I'll be taking data from. BumblebeeWatch.org was started, I think, last year by the Xerces Society. It's a really nice place to not only upload your data, but learn about bumblebees as well. Um, Texas Bumblebees Facebook page, if you do Facebook, that's another forum to also exchange information with other people who are interested. Or finally, if you don't like any of the social stuff, you can just email me. If you have an email address, there's my, my email. You can send me your picture and your information. So I'd really appreciate that. Um, and if you know other people from other parts of the state, ask them as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have a project associated on iNaturalist with the bumblebees? You know, I don't specifically, but there is a bee project on there. Texas bees or something like that. Okay. Yeah. All right, so all that being said, um, just a little bit of wrap up. So just as a reminder, bumblebees need species rich foraging grounds all the way from spring to fall. And our urban green spaces do provide habitat for that. So you can help using your urban spaces. And so planting those plants, don't use pesticides if you can, and report your, your photos of bumblebees if you can. So all that being said, I have to thank everyone who's helped me. I've had lots of people help out in the field, including my little boy, and in the lab. And, oh yeah, I also want to say thanks to the Horned Lizard License Plate Funds. That helps support my research. So y'all can get Horned Lizard License Plates. That, it supports good research. Not only mine, lots of really great research supported through that fund. And here are some of the resources that I mentioned. So these are the websites. This is a great place to find plant lists and then just other information about bees, pollinators, and whatnot. And these are three really good books. If you're really interested in starting to learn how to identify bumblebees, this one just came out last year as well called Bumblebees of North America. And it has great pictures and ID guides for every single bumblebee in, in the United States. And that's just natural history and then ways to help. So that is my presentation. I'll take questions if you've got them. Yeah. I could see it. I mean, honeybees, not bumblebees so much, but honeybees will go to pools or of water to get water. 
they take it back to cool their hives off. So, yeah, if they're taking that up, that would be bad. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and on that note, you know, they've started to label plants at Home Depot and Lowe's to say that they've been treated with neonicotinoids. But if you see those labels, they say something like, your plant is protected against aphids and mealybugs and stuff like that. So you really have to read those labels carefully. Um, yes. You know, I'm, I don't know that answer. Um, I would think that maybe the first year. After, there is a time period at which it has decayed, and it's not in your plant anymore. But I don't have that answer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sorry. I see them all around my trees. I live in Dayton County, west of Sanger, mm -hmm. and they like the sand, like the soft sand. And they're bumblebees? And, yeah, and we have wisteria, mm. so they love that wisteria. Yeah. But how deep are their holes? So, you know, they could be maybe a foot deep. They could go a lot deeper, too. I've read that sometimes they can go through really convoluted paths, so they'll dig a long tunnel and then finally get there. Um, they really like abandoned rodent holes, so that might be sort of a tell of how deep that they'll go. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, how well do, you know, like people sell, um, I guess, houses to a bumblebee? Do they really work well? <laughs> you know, there's countering evidence on that, or conflicting evidence on that. Um, everyone I've talked to who has had a bumblebee box um, says that they're, really just attract wasps. So, <laughs> uh, but that being said, I, uh, out in the Northeast, I just read that a, a girl who actually studies birds, so she was studied chickadees, was finding that bumblebees were taking up in the chickadee boxes. Yeah, so there's some research that has just started on maybe trying to assemble the chickadee boxes and put similar nesting material that the because I guess the the mosses or something like that they like the really soft stuff, so maybe chickadee boxes. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I do not have a picture. I do not have a picture of that, but I will tell you that we found one. Although we did not see the actual nest, we found the site of it because they wanted to attack us. Um, so, so the grass was probably up to here on me, and they were going into it, me like right at the ground surface. And it seemed like there might have been a little cavity in the middle of that grass. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, well thank you all so much. Okay, so one quick little thing. Next time you're out and you see those little things, you tap, tap, tap first. <laughs> so they don't come up and hit you too thank much. You so thank much. you so much. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Oh.